Good morning. We are all set, I think. Take some. So welcome, welcome to you all. I mean, I, I, uh, do you hear me well? Hopefully, yeah, great. So, um, yeah, my name is Mario Marinello, and I have the pleasure and the honor to moderate this first uh, panel of today, which um, is going to be uh, focused on the use of artificial intelligence and automation in the workplace. More specifically, we will discuss the subject of algorithmic management. Now, I guess after yesterday, I don't need to give you too much uh, insights about the context. Yet maybe let me stress one important element. The, the key question that we are going to address today does not so much have a quantitative nature. So strictly speaking, uh, we are not asking whether AI will make humans redundant uh, or whether fewer jobs will be available uh, in the future for humans to, to perform. Quite the contrary, the question that we are going to address has a more qualitative nature. Uh, so we, we are actually concerned not so much with technology substituting humans, but more with how technology can complement humans in a way that it alters the relationship between them. So the, the obvious concern in, in, this, uh, in this context is that technology may further exacerbate certain power asymmetries that are already present in the workplace. Huh? So uh, clearly, the, the fear is that AI might allow some sort of exploitation of workers by their employers. So this is the overarching concern, and the idea of the panel is really to, to set the stage for you know, the discussion then will take place also throughout the day with uh, certain you know, more specific uh, um, workshops. Now, for the purpose, we, we have a great panel of academics. Um, they, they came from far away, uh, from Australia, from California, uh, well, from the Netherlands, <laughs> so, and from Italy. <laughs> but uh, thank you for coming. So we, um, we have different angles, which is uh, what I, I think is you know, a very interesting aspect of, the, of this panel. We have a, a jurist, a sociologist, an economist, and an anthropologist. Uh, so we will try to tackle the question from different perspectives. Let me introduce the speakers, actually. Jeremiah Sadam Pras, in speaking order, not of importance, <laughs> all, all the same. <laughs> Jeremiah um, Adam Pras, who is professor of law and associate dean of research in the faculty of law at Oxford University. Then we have Annette Bernard, who is uh, director of uh, the technology and work program at the UC Berkeley Labor Center. Then we have Martin Goose, who is full professor of economics and institutions at the Faculty of Law, Economics and Governance at Utrecht University. And finally, Maria Sapignoli, who is assistant professor in social anthropology in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Milan. So we roughly have um, one hour and 15 minutes, and the plan is to have two rounds of short remarks uh, by the speakers. In the first round, I will uh, prompt the speakers to describe the issue, so to do some sort of positive analysis of the problem. And then afterwards, in the second round, we will move to more, a more, more normative uh, dimension. So I will ask the speakers to come forward with uh, you know, what they think we should do or we should not do about algorithmic management. And after that, I hope we will uh, have plenty of time uh, with uh, you know, questions and interactions with the audience. I think uh, at least uh, 25, uh, 30 minutes. Uh, you have the Slido code, so please feel free uh, to, to ask questions through, uh, through Slido. Uh, and also, I mean, like, uh, you will have an opportunity to speak with the microphone, of course. So let's, uh, let's get started. Um, Jeremiah, please uh, let us understand what, what, what is algorithmic management? Uh, is there a clear cut definition? Um, can you give us some illustration what is this all about? Floor Thank you for the kind introduction and the invitation to join you today. Um, I sometimes joke that um, we don't talk about AI coming for workers' jobs when we talk about algorithmic management. We talk about AI coming for managers' jobs. It's really traditional management roles that we both see augmented or even entirely replaced and automated. So really what we think about when we talk about algorithmic management is the pretty much whole set of the traditional employer functions, from hiring workers to managing the day-to-day -day enterprise, potentially all the way through to firing them, and then either augmenting or fully automating those functions. 
Now, it's important that we don't get too stuck in the actual definitions, but the technology is very fast moving. Sometimes, you know, artificial intelligence, various forms of machine learning are used, but there's also more traditional algorithms that complement each other in the exercise of these functions. Also, whilst a lot of people still think of algorithmic management as something quite freestanding, you sort of buy in the software to hire somebody, increasingly today, it's actually part and parcel of broader management software. Software like SAP, like Oracle, generally sort of business enterprise software increasingly can be deployed mm -hmm. towards these algorithmic management ends. One other thing I think that's important to note is that it's very much started in the gig economy. So the platforms in the gig economy, they're very much in the first wave of creating algorithmic management technologies. Mm -hmm. But certainly, and not least as a result of the COVID pandemic, today algorithmic management has come right across the socioeconomic spectrum. It no longer really matters whether you work in a warehouse, whether you work um, for one of the platform operators, or whether you work in professional services or even universities. Increasingly, we see these technologies right across the mm -hmm. spectrum. Now, there's three things I think that we might want to talk a bit more, and that's what's really novel about these technologies. Because you could say, well, to some extent, this is just automating exercise of traditional managerial powers. But actually, there's at least three fundamental distinctions that then might also pose new regulatory challenges. First, the kind of data that we now collect, in terms of the granularity, in terms of the ubiquity of their um, collection. Second, the processing of that information, and that is where sort of emerging technologies, machine learning in particular, comes in. Very much about drawing inferences, creating patterns, analysing those patterns. Mm. So it's again quite distinct. And finally, I think when things go wrong, and we still need to think about the human counterfactual, when things go wrong, the kind of mistakes we're seeing are quite distinct. Whereas human error is quite random, quite stochastic, with machines, the error can be quite deterministic and can be very certain and in very fixed patterns. So those are, I think, the three key challenges when we start thinking about algorithmic management. And I think Annette is going to have to yeah. offer us on those Thank challenges. You. Thank you, Jeremias, for a very, very uh, nice introduction. Um, so, Annette, uh, your turn. Uh, Thank you for joining us uh, uh, again from, uh, from, from California. Um, can you please tell us uh, about the potential benefits and the potential risks of algorithmic management? And also, of course, I mean, like, you know, uh, it would be great if you give us uh, also a bit the, the US perspective on, on, on the subject. Thank you. Ha happy to. And uh, hello, I send greetings from California, the belly of the beast. Um, so, for sure, uh, I think we can all imagine uh, very positive uses um, of this tech, obviously, um, most of all to increase productivity, to increase efficiency. Uh, we can imagine that this technology can be used to make jobs safer, uh, less arduous, more interesting, uh, give workers more latitude, more room for growth, um, enable them to upskill and build careers. Um, there's been a lot of talk about how this technology can increase access to employment for people with disabilities. So there is a long list here. And for sure, um, I am a big fan of the idea of um, workers and unions and employers getting together and co-designing, um, you know, win-win technology that both, um, you know, in in can increase productivity and can result in good jobs. Um, but... Uh, especially coming from the U.S., uh, where we have almost no regulation of work, digital workplace technology at this point, and we have low union density, I have to tell you that um, on, in our country, the concern is much more about the potential harms. And here I will say we have a big problem that we have very little data. We have very little data on how many employers are actually using algorithmic management at a detailed level, how many workers are being impacted by it, and especially we have very little data, representative data on the harms. And so I'm going to tell you about some of the harms that have come up from on the ground that are being reported by workers uh, that are coming out from industry studies, but this is really an area where we need significantly more research. So some of the harms are obviously, many of you heard about the concern about bias and discrimination in hiring algorithms, for example. Um, constant excessive monitoring, which has been shown to have significant mental health impacts. Um, the routinization and de-skilling of jobs, which we see in a lot of frontline service work. Um, productivity monitoring and work speed up. And here, of course, you know, the Amazon warehouses have become sort of the poster child. The growth of contingent work, like on-demand platforms. Uh, suppression of the right to organize. We have examples in the U.S. where employers are using heat mapping and more sophisticated algorithms to predict which establishments are most likely to unionize. 
And then I would say loss of privacy, autonomy, and dignity, which are much harder to measure, but which I think are so elemental to all of us in terms of our identity um, at work. And so you ask, which of these are we most concerned about? I will share with you that in the US, the thing we are most concerned about of all of these harms is what we call um, systems that effectively automate the human. Um, so that, uh, you know, monitor at a micro level uh, via, via surveillance or haptics um, or sensors, everything that the worker does uh, that guide the exact sequences of tasks that the worker does um, and that then put in, um, uh, you know, ever increasing productivity thresholds. Um, you know, at the extreme here, the dystopian version is that we become fleshy machines that are moved around the workplace by algorithms. And I stress this, as it, this may sound a little bit outlandish, I would say in a lot of uh, low-wage industries in America, you're <coughs> starting to see this kind of system being put in place, and I would uh, flag here the equity issues. These are low-wage sectors where the workers are primarily women and workers of color and immigrants. Um, uh, I, I flag this because I think it's very important for us to ground the policy discussion that we are going to have in terms of the actual ways that employers are using this tech and the actual impacts on workers. Mm -hmm. We really have to ground it in the lived experiences as we begin to document more and more how this tech is being rolled out. It is my um, assessment that we are only at the beginning of the adoption of these technologies, and we're about to you know, take off on that very steep adoption curve. And so right now is the time to actually begin to really get our bearings um, as we think about regulation. Great. Th thanks a lot also for leading me quite smoothly to the next question for, for Martin. So you are an economist. What can you tell us about adoption? Uh, is this like a, you know, a stable upward trend that we are, we are witnessing or is more a temporary hype? What can you tell us about that? Uh, good morning, everyone. and Thank you for the invite. Um, so there's now some surveys that are emerging so it's the, f the first sort of like descriptive statistics that are emerging in some studies in the US, also Europe, that are asking firms about the adoption of AI. And what you see is there's a number of things that you can take away from, from those descriptives. So one is that there's relatively few firms that have already adopted AI. About 5% of the firms are now using AI. And by AI, I mean like the, the modern technologies. Um, but those 5% of firms are typically large firms. Mm. So they, they represent 20 to 25% of total employment. The second important takeaway, I think, is that these large firms that are adopting AI are observed across sectors in the economy. And that's very different, for example, from robots, which are typically also being adopted by mainly large firms, but in manufacturing. So AI has this, has this much broader scope of, um, of applications um, across sectors, also service sectors in uh, the economy. A third takeaway is that they've also asked in these surveys, um, they've also asked why firms adopt uh, AI. And one of the main reasons are to automate processes, uh, which of course, you know, for the workforce sounds like a risk. And there's other studies that then go into, you know, what types of jobs we think, or is AI currently automating, looking at, you know, the information that you see in patents regarding AI, or um, looking at the contents of vacancies and the skills that are required um, that are um, not only complementary, but that are also could be um, substituting workers. And so what you typically find in those studies is that AI can, has also the potential to automate um, like, like non-routine, more cognitive tasks. So, you know, again, kind of comparing it to robots, uh, there's quite substantial evidence that what robots did was to automate away uh, a lot of the uh, routine tasks. Think of a machine operator in manufacturing or, you know, very basic uh, tasks done by office clerks, like sending, you know, sending mail or, or whatnot. That all has been automated, leading to a polarization of the labor force, so a disappearing middle class of jobs. So what we now think is that AI could also be, uh, has the potential to also automate more skilled work. Mm. 
Um, and that's also something that you see in the first studies that are emerging about uh, platforms that are adopting AI or companies that are experimenting with AI, that it's, it's not just the middle skilled uh, and you know, yeah, the, the routine tasks that are being automated, there's also this potential of, of um, higher end jobs being um, automated. Now, I'd like to end by saying that you know, next to automation, um, there's of course also a lot of evidence that um, technology in the past, and I think the same is true for AI, has also to, is also creating a lot of new new tasks and new jobs. Mm -hmm. You know, often indirectly through changes in in, in uh, product demand or not. Um, but I'm certainly not one kind of that you take away from from uh, this that you know 50% um, of all jobs are going to be automated by AI. I don't think that's a realistic scenario because there's also a lot of new job creation yep. from AI. Yep. No, thank you, thank you, Martin, also for linking for uh, with the discussion of yesterday. Um, Maria, uh, big thank to you, uh, especially because uh, you know you, you really bring a fresh perspective. Here you are an anthropologist. Uh, normally we have panels in which are full of economists and lawyers, and whatever, but we miss this perspective. So thank you uh, for doing this. I wanted to ask you what are what are uh, the cultural implications of you know adopting AI. In, in specific contexts like uh, the, you know, workplaces, but you know, in communities, let's say, uh, so given uh, your, um, your research. Yeah, so thank you, thank you, Mario, thank you for the invitation. Um, yeah, like uh, the kind of cultural implication, I think it depends, first of all, by the characteristic of the system, not that is used in these places, because as we heard different time already, the system are not uh, neutral, in, even in their origin, but they represent themselves a culture. And uh, this culture that could be also standardized in automatic decision making in the workplace will uh, position itself in existing relationship, in existing culture, you know? So like, for instance, now I can imagine, you know, also like the tech culture from, you know, your, from where you come from today, you know, this kind of big tech, but also from China, for instance, the big players, you know, this kind of tech culture of the workplace will travel behind Europe. I already see my field work as an anthropologist is in Southern Africa, and also most, most recently in, uh, in New Zealand. And I see how, you know, like this kind of, tools travels and they don't take into consideration you know the cultural context and what does it create in that context mm -hmm. okay and uh, and for instance so the implication depends also so in how and in which context with this technology are, are, are um, implemented and uh, for instance uh, to give you some kind of example uh, also like how um, if uh, in the relationship between the worker and the employee or the among workers, you know, if these tools is used to um, mediate relationship or it is used to replace relationship, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then, uh, you know, also we talked about creativity, you know, and we say, okay, now the, in the future we need job that, you know, from creative people, people, you know, that are creative will be employed. But also the creativity that is coming from the workplace, you know, from the interaction of differences, you know, of people that have different opinions that can, you know, critical thinking in the sense of a different point of view, you know, can also be compromised in that sense, you know. And even if it's true, somebody can say, you know, actually, you know, I, this automatic technology make me free from some boring task and I have more time to think, that can happen too. But uh, that as an individual thinker is one thing, as a collectivity is another thing. And finally, I want just to say that, you know, in, in certain, how do we measure the impact? Uh, you know, it depends also how we measure like the identity, what, what, what somebody that does a job uh, want to kind of get out of that job. You know, some, in some contexts, you know, it's just a salary. Some contexts are personal growing. In other contexts, it's also very important the kind of social, cultural, and even economic uh, uh, capital that you gain from the relationship that you have with other people. So, 
for instance, in the context of what I work with, is very important, as we were talking before. The idea of the individual is not just an individual. You know, they, they talk, some anthropologists talk about individual. For instance, in Oceania, you know, there are some communities, the Kanak community, New Caledonia, the Maori community, but also in Southern Africa, some community that is, as individual, you know, it, I'm a individual, I'm the, relation, I'm the result of different relationships. And actually, you know, so if I go to work, you know, I don't, uh, my position there is connected to the other, you know, and what I do is connected to the other. So if I kind of compromise or replace this connection, what are the results? And also in this, we, we, there is, we are at the beginning, so there is not, there are more questions, there are not answers. There are some predictions, considering about AI, we can do as an academic prediction too. But okay, let's finish like that. Yeah. No, thank you very much. I mean, I could just, uh, you know, suggest that there are very deep implications that sometimes we are, we are not we are overlooking it because they are not so evident, but they are so so deep. Uh, so thank you for 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 doing this, and thank to all of you for the first round. Um, I think we can conclude as a takeaway that this is uh, definitely the serve to to keep a close eye, no? As uh, as uh, President Van der Leyen said on, on on this from a policy perspective. So let, let's now move to these more normative dimensions. Uh, what, what should we do or we should not do about algorithmic management? Um, and let's uh, start again with you, Jeremias. So, Bill, a bit of a devil advocate's question. So, uh, you know, we have a lot of regulations here in Europe. Um, we, have a, we have a EU labor law, clearly. We have the GDPR. Maybe soon we will have the AI Act. Why do we need to do anything about algorithmic management? It's a very good question. I think the first thing when we think about regulation is to make very clear that just because a technology is new does not necessarily mean that our existing rules can go out. It's really important that we always think about first what is the existing key that's there. And so some of the challenges that Annette has mentioned, for example, we have existing laws both at the union level and at member state level. So bias, for example, discrimination, the existing equal treatment laws very much apply, whether it's a human that does the discriminating or whether it's an automated system, in a sense, is not directly relevant there. Similarly, um, in my team, we run a project that's funded by the European Research Council where we look at both existing rules and potential new rules. Data protection, exactly as you mentioned, is another area where we have existing regimes that do apply. And it doesn't matter, again, whether you're an employee, whether you're not an employee, you're definitely a data subject the moment AI systems process your data, whether it's in surveillance or then also in exercising management functions. At the same time, however, I think we do need to think about whether there are gaps and what those gaps are specifically. And in our work and in a blueprint which we recently published, we suggested there are two big gaps in current regulatory regimes. First, the sort of massive privacy harms and the exacerbation of information asymmetries in the workplace mm. that are a direct result of deploying algorithmic management techniques. And second, the demise of managerial agency, this idea that you have a bureaucratic structure in the workplace and we ascribe responsibility to the exercise of those managerial functions. Mm. So the challenge for any new regulation will be both to tackle the information asymmetries and the novel privacy harm, as well as try to make sure there is space for contestation and this re-establishment of human agency. Mm -hmm. Now, what can law do to do that? The AI Act probably won't plug those gaps. Mm -hmm. um, it's definitely to be welcomed, this recognition that deploying AI systems in the workplace is high risk, but the particular regulatory choices in the AI Act, using essentially a product liability regime under the new legislative framework, won't actually be able to address those specific mm -hmm. gaps. Mm -hmm. The Platform Work Directive, on the other hand, I think is extremely promising in its chapter on algorithmic management, because we have functions both in terms of addressing the information asymmetries, through information provision, for example, through the ban on certain techniques altogether, but also then thinking about having various forms of contestation, which is key to re-establishing that agency. The one big wish, however, though, is to say that it's the Platform Work Directive, and as we've seen, I think, and we agree, algorithmic management, whilst it started in the gig economy, is by no means limited thus. So I think going forward, ideally, it would be something like the algorithmic management provisions in the Platform Work Directive, but to see them extended right across the full socioeconomic spectrum. And adopted. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jeremias. Okay, so, so, so we have those gaps. Let's assume that we have those gaps. Um, Annette, what do you think then we should do about it? I mean, should we uh, establish new workers' rights, for example? And 
what is the U.S. experience. I know that you are, you know, uh, at state level, for example, in California, you are attempting to do something of that sort. Can you please share it with us? Yeah, well, first to state the obvious in, in the U.S., we have massive envy of all your laws and regulations <laughs> because it'll be a long time before we see any at the federal level. Um, so, um, uh, yes, I believe strongly, uh, uh, based on a process that we did in California, that we actually do need new rights in law, new standards around technology in the workplace, both worker rights and employer responsibilities. We help to facilitate and shape a multi-year process uh, in California that included around 70 stakeholders, unions, immigrant worker centers, um, uh, privacy experts, employment and labor lawyers, and racial justice advocates. And the question on the table is what types of rights uh, do workers need and deserve around uh, new tech in the workplace, especially algorithmic management? And the scan of U.S. employment and labor law clearly, uh, clearly concluded uh, similar to Jeremiah said there, you know, there are a few parts that maybe could cover some of these issues, mainly anti-discrimination law, but actually that, especially in the U.S., there are very few provisions that can get at the harms that we are talking about. Um, what came out of that process was a very comprehensive uh, legislative framework. I don't, I'm not going to bore you with all the details of it. It had four pieces. The first was the worker data rights. The second part was uh, guardrails on electronic monitoring. The third was guardrails on algorithmic management. And the fourth was impact assessments. And what I wanted to lift up uh, is to give you three examples of where uh, current law really does not help workers. I mean, the data privacy stuff, you know, we can figure out similar to GDPR. The impact assessments, you guys are developing a, mo a model. It's the guardrails on what employers do with these systems that is really where we need a lot of innovation, similar to what you said in your gaps. And so I just want to quickly tell you three things that worker advocates and unions raised up. One is a desire to limit how much employers rely on these systems in making consequential decisions. So when an employer is going to fire somebody or, or discipline somebody, really limiting how much they base that decision on uh, a piece of data from electronic monitoring, um, a profile from an algorithmic system. There's a strong desire to ensure that those types of consequential decisions are still made by a human. Mm. That is a real challenge to mm. figure out how to put into law. A second concept mm. that came up a lot was around um, human in command. What kinds of rights do workers have who are increasingly working with automated systems to override those systems and not be retaliated against? That's something very hard to figure out how to put into law, but it is coming up over and over again. In healthcare and in uh, social welfare, nurses and, and um, social welfare workers are increasingly working with systems that are making decisions about care <laughs> And workers are reporting that they are not clear about when they have the authority to override those systems in the interest of the patient. There's a lot to be figured out there. And the third one, back to the productivity uh, systems, um, there's a real desire to figure out how do we put limits on how much algorithms are demanding of workers? How much is too yep. much? How much is too much to ask the warehouse worker to do? And how do you figure that out in law? Do you come up with industry-specific metrics? Of, you know, you can only do X boxes an hour. You can only treat, you know, X patients an hour. This is a very difficult set of questions to figure out in law. And yet, I think worker advocates in the U.S. were very clear: we need legislative, we need labor standards around technology to, to protect our workers. Precisely because only six percent of uh, the private sector workforce in the U.S. is unionized, and so workers are really dependent on law uh, to protect them. Great. No, thank you. Thank you. So it's very complex. It's a challenge uh, that we need to, to, to address. Um, Martin, again, a, a devil advocate question, uh, because you are an economist. Uh, so, uh, you know, <laughs> the, 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 the f first thing that might come to mind is, well, you know, but, but why do we need to intervene? I mean, are these markets really failing? Or is more because I mean, like if you think, for example, you put yourself in the shoes of a, let's say, an informed employer, and you know that you are, you know, squeezing your employees with excessive monitoring, and you know that this will uh, 
have drawbacks on productivity, so may, maybe you are going to, let's say, internalize that, anticipate that, and, you know, correct it. So it's just a question of education, maybe. I mean, we just need to educate um, employers about the consequences of, of using a, a, um, a AI, or, or there is more than that. Oh, I, I think it's more than that. So uh, uh, today's labor markets are very institutionalized, and particularly we have a very um, broad system of social rights. So you cannot think, think those kind of institutions, those social rights away. So I don't believe in the scenario where you know, we can just let things go and hope that the labor market somehow self-corrects. Mm. Now, if you look at the social rights that typically European countries have, I mean, it's, it's a broad set of rights that we have going from so contract law at the individual level to uh, at the firm level, works councils, um, also collective agreements at the firm level, at the sector level, we have you know, social security, and then we also have legislation about, for example, occupational health and safety. Um, and I think you can look at these, these different dimensions of the social rights and think about how are we going to use the institutions that we have to tackle the challenges from AI. And you know, these are, I think, broadly speaking, uh, automation, but also algorithmic management, uh, including monitoring. I think that's an important one. Um, it's about data ownership. Um, it's about um, imbalances in market power, so large firms having too much power in product markets, also labor markets, and skill shortages. So I think these are the challenges. And so one thing that I think we should try to do is to think of, you know, given these different dimensions of social rights that we have in European countries, how can we use those to tackle these challenges? And let me give you uh, two examples. So the first one is um, the importance of works councils. So, for example, in the Netherlands, large firms need to have works councils, and works councils actually have the right uh, to advise or even consent. Um, so give consent when um, big companies adopt new technologies. Now, if you then look up the law, you see that those, those rules were written in the mid-1990s when we introduced swipe cards. So they're not at all adequate, adequate to deal with, for example, algorithmic management uh, of uh, people who work, so employees who work from home. So how, how are we going to kind of adjust the law to... Um, to give works councils a stronger voice in you know, what technologies firms should adopt and um, how can we steer those technologies towards being complementary rather than, than automating new jobs. The second example is very close to Annette's home. It's um, the recent strike by the, workers guilds, uh, the Writers Guilds of America. Mm -hmm. um, so um, the, the big production houses like Netflix, HBO, Disney, um, they um, went, so they had to negotiate new contracts with uh, the writers of the scripts, um, which you know, is something that has to happen before these scripts go into production. And so what happened was that these big production houses, they wanted to renegotiate the working conditions, the minimum requirements um, for these writers uh, downwards. Um, threatening that if they wouldn't agree, then uh, they would just use AI to, to write the scripts. And so if you look at the kind of like, the, the questions that were on the table, some of the key questions were, for example, um, can AI write scripts that are as good as the writers uh, can write scripts? And then, you know, the writer said, well, no, AI cannot, be, have, cannot have the same creativity um, than um, then AI, so AI cannot have you know, the same creativity than the writers. And then the production houses said, well, we don't care about the quality. People will just watch whatever we show them. <laughs> um, so the second question is, that was on the table is, well, who... So, of course, these AI systems would have to be trained by existing scripts. But then these existing scripts were written by writers. So who owns these existing scripts? that need to be used to train these AI systems. And so I think this was kind of like maybe the perfect storm where you had, you know, ChatGPT and these large language models being particularly good at automating um, writing scenarios, um, writing scripts. And um, the, the, um, so the technology kind of uh, interacted with um, working conditions and renegotiating working conditions. And I think, you know, I, 
I do expect that in the future we will see more kind of uh, strained relationships, industrial relations will be challenged, I think, by uh, AI algorithmic management. And I think an important question is how are we going to deal with that? So what are unions going to do? How are they going to approach the negotiations given um, you know, the, the algorithmic management and the broader implications of AI? I think there's a broad agenda there to, to, that we still have to tackle. Great. Thanks a lot, Martin. Okay, so Maria, uh, can you please help us to try to put this in a in more global context? Uh, so there is now a, 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 an ongoing attempt to uh, create more convergence in, uh, you know, for what concerns AI in general, but this is of course so, so relevant for, for labor markets. So what can you tell us about like, this, uh, this global attempt of, uh, of, you know, of uh, having more harmonization in the way in which we look at these uh, uh, problems. Um, are there risks, for example, in, the, in this uh, process mm -hmm. that might be a little bit uh, top-down somehow? <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, yes, when we think about global, we need to think about what is global, you know, because most of the time, globality is not really inclusive. So there are often K players, as we, you know better than me, I imagine, but uh, there are, you know, powerful players that have more voice than others. So the question is also how, how we make this process global, because I think that there need to be a kind of global governance framework as a kind of, uh, uh, pro can, because can pro it provides provide a baseline for justice, uh, it provides uh, a global framework for protection, and, and this kind of you know, technology, as we know, they, they travel and, uh, you know, and our data travel and all this kind of thing. So we need a, a global framework, but how we make it global? And, to, and it's not just kind of including the different stakeholders, but who these stakeholders are. So for instance, yes, we are from civil society, for the industry, for the state or whatever, but also how representative are of the diversity, you know, of the diversity to make it global. So um, because what we, I think, one of the risks is that uh, we create a global framework that is, is kind of end up uh, maybe imposing, I don't know if it's imposing is a too strong word, but anyway, uh, uh, imposing certain kind of value in context that even if you have the best intention to do that, but it play out, they play out in the wrong way because mm -hmm. they don't work there. And um, so, um, like, uh, I, uh, I think that uh, um, when we, we I heard yesterday about the initiative of ILO, you know, to create, and also the UN UNESCO had already something, the UN General As um, Assembly is doing something. So, the thing is that uh, how, also in this global forum, how we, considering also the disparities in resource and the disparity in power, how we guarantee the participation of, of diversity. And, um, and also because, for instance, like just a little example before I finish to talk, but um, when I was working with this group, uh, uh, and I, I, I work with uh, indigenous peoples, and, uh, and um, who, who define as an indigenous peoples. And uh, there is, for instance, an indigenous movement on AI and uh, on artificial intelligence in trying to develop a kind of first uh, artificial intelligence that is in line with values that are alternatives that are different based on different kind of epistemologies but also you know all connected to that also kind of policy that uh, you know govern this system that take into consideration indigenous values and for instance the typical one is the one of collective rights and so when we talk about privacy and uh, so privacy of the individual privacy of the collective when we talk about consent consent how of the individual of the collective mm -hmm. when we talk about data you know data for some groups some data you know there is not a distinction between the data the value of a data like my person you know and the data that represent me at the same kind of really value. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you give it out, it's really uh, kind of disempowering me, it's taking out part of my identity, there is some kind of dif 
different relationship with the, with the data that maybe I can have. So just this to make a bit of confusion, but uh, no just, to say, <laughs> just to say, like, when we, we, to go back to your question, when we think about global governance, we first of all need to think about what is global, and also as European, that we, that's this Brussels Br Br effect. Mm -hmm. uh, as a European citizen, I think that we have responsibility in kind of taking into consideration this diversity. Consider that, you know, this is influencing the groups that in the past, as European, we colonized, you know, for instance. Yeah. So, you know, that's finish like that. No, no. no, thank you, thank you. Of course, I mean, so it's, it's complex to get it right, um, but also when we get it right, it's still right from our perspective. So, yes. you know, I mean, like, and it's so, so there is an additional layer of complexity, mm -hmm. <laughs> if you want. Great, thank you. Thank you also for staying really, you know, uh, on time, all of you. Uh, we now have uh, actually 22 minutes. I have a timer in front uh, of me for questions. Uh, so please, Feel free to, um, to ask those questions from the floor. Yeah, I have, a, and I also have Slido here. I mean, I can read it like now, but I mean, I can see uh, somebody who wants to intervene. So please, a microphone there. And yeah, with the light here, please. Thank you, thank you. Stefan Gran, um, working for the European Trade Union Confederation. And uh, thank you all for the, for the really well panel. Um, and I also thank you to, to Annette because you have been the first person who mentioned unions today because I was totally missing it in Mr. Breton's uh, speech uh, on the yeah, AI in the workplace and no, no word about workers and the unions. So um, I would be interested to hear a bit more where Martin was stopping because you were stopping to think what can unions do? So I would like to, to hear uh, what uh, we chose to think, what, what we can do. So maybe you have an answer. Um, and indeed, uh, I think it was also Jeremiah uh, mentioned it, and I think Annette as well, the question about um, how we can shape how, how AI is used in the workplace and what we rights we need. Uh, and I think indeed the, the Platform Work Directive has some hints already, but I'm pretty sure it's not enough, because as we, as we know, information consultation is one thing, but um, in some countries we have also participation rights, also it means also where workers can really limit the use and employers have to engage in negotiations with us. And I think that is an important step forward, I think. And that would be also nice to hear you Ideas on it. Thank yeah. you. So the, the role of trade unions. You you want to take the question or, we, uh, or yeah yeah sure. So I, so I I think um, what I see from the research side there is a renewed interest in industrial relations, and um, there's a number of things that are I think remarkable. So one of the things that we saw in surveys in the Netherlands, for example, is that. Uh, so young people are less likely to be a union member. And so they asked them why. And kind of like the short answer was um, that they, have, they, didn't, they haven't thought about the question of becoming a union member or not. So I think that there clearly is this disconnect with a younger generation that unions um, should worry about. Because there were also the follow-up questions about, you know, what would you expect from unions, etc to these young people, and it seems that they, they expect a lot more than unions just negotiating wages and work conditions. Um, they also want to um, ha have a union that represents their um, work-life balance, that um, is about technologies and how you know, um, data are protected. So I think there's a lot of, of maybe miscommunication, or at least unions are not, from the survey in the Netherlands that, that I know of, uh, unions are not very well known among younger people, so I think that's that's one clear, um, I think, challenge for unions. And another one is that, um, just looking again at data, um, unions tend to be mostly representing uh, workers in larger firms in manufacturing, and of course, because manufacturing has been declining in terms of employment, um, you see that. Um, there, the, like the ground for unions to be successful um, has eroded over the last couple of decades. So switching towards um, also representation in services, smaller, younger firms, I think, is, is a challenge. And um, probably also you know, a different way of um, negotiating. So I think the kind of like the traditional way of, as, as we saw, for example, in, um, 
in, in the, the, with the uh, Writers Guilds of America versus the studios, but also car manufacturing. It's like the additional kind of way where employers and unions are very opposed. Um, I think that way of, of um, thinking about how to um, implement new technologies, AI, algorithmic management, um, yeah, think of ways in which you can do that in a much more constructive mm -hmm. um, process. Great. Thank you. Annette. Yeah, I mean, just to build on that, um, uh, so thank you for asking the question. Um, I had meant to elaborate earlier. I mean, just to be clear, like, from what we've seen in the U.S. when we do case studies, when unions are at the table and they are um, working very closely with employers, it is absolutely clear to me that what we really want and need is that, that workers are at the table from the get-go. Um, the model where unions uh, negotiate after technology is introduced and just to mitigate impacts, that is not the model that we want here. And I will just make the positive case here, like workers have an incredible amount to bring to the table. All of us in our jobs have a whole list of things that we know do not work well at our jobs mm -hmm. and that we know how to fix. Yep. Um, and that is really the kernel of this. Workers need to be at the table when the problem is being defined, when, when the employer is trying to figure out, you know, what are the key pro problems we have in terms of our production process? How can technology help solve them? When workers are at the table, right at that point, you often get what we call, in shorthanding in the US, win-win outcomes, where the technology is designed both, it, it both produces productivity gains, but is also resulting in better working conditions for workers. And I will say, we are actually in the process of writing up a whole bunch of case studies of, of when this works su successfully. And in the US, um, the key to having this work su successfully, which I think is partly what you were touching on, is you have to um, have a baseline of guarantee that jobs will be retained, that workers will not be hurt. If you are trying to negotiate both the technology at the same time as the jobs and the wages and the working conditions, it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. um, you, Usually there's a sequencing where, um, you know, there's an agreement on the economic impacts and then you can co-design the tech. I think this is absolutely the type of thing we should be trying to incentivize in the U.S. Obviously here in Europe you have works councils which are great vehicles for this. Mm -hmm. But I am very interested in discussions about how public policy can further incentivize this kind of process because mm -hmm. I think that is how we get good tech. Yeah, yeah, right, right. So the question is also, I mean, how you empower Maybe also, I guess, there is an issue with access to information and transparency, right? I mean, like what workers know about what's happening. I mean, like, yeah. that can also play a very important role. Okay, um, I guess there might be other questions, but um, we'll get to that, uh, to that question. But let me just, uh, to be fair also for the Slido guys, um, I'll, I'll read the, the first question here, um, which is, once regulation is put in place in one region, what are the challenges posed by globalization on markets, <laughs> trading with regions with different labor standards? That's, that's the question that the, in a, first in the ranking uh, currently. And uh, is AI in management uh, able to give people a right to be imperfect, to make mistakes, to learn, to have a, a bad, and then, I mean, I cannot read anymore because there is, a, you know, it's cut, the text. But okay, you, you, you get the glimpse of it. Uh, then we take the, the question from the floor uh, over there, and then we, you know, please, meanwhile, think about these uh, two questions from Slido, and, and then we, we address them. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Victor Bernhards. I work for the largest trade union in Sweden. To follow up on the previous question, I can recommend you all to read the OECD employment outlook this year on AI, which shows an interesting positive correlation between AI implementation and social dialogue, where AI implementation becomes more successful where social dialogue exists. I mean, there's so much to unpack here. Thanks for a great panel. One question on the algorithmic management in traditional workplaces. When I talk to companies, they say, and if they're larger companies, say they have 20,000, 30,000 employees, and skills, which is something we discussed a lot yesterday and we'll talk about later today as well. I mean, if you have 20 employees, you could realistically know what they are doing and what their sort of skills are. If you have 20,000 employees, it doesn't really matter the size of the HR department. You will sometimes not know what they do. And some companies face great challenges. Look at, for example, the automotive industry. You have to shift from combustion engines to electric engines. You have to do huge skill shifts. And 
with this challenge, uh, algorithmic management uh, in the companies that I talk to, they say this is, looks really interesting because we can use uh, artificial intelligence systems, which of course are designed to manage large data sets. But then you would need data sets on your employees' skills. And that presents a whole set of challenges so that you've touched upon integrity, um, et cetera, et cetera. So if you guys would reflect a bit on implementation of algorithmic management in these large traditional companies, I would be very much interested. Thanks so much. Great. Thanks a lot. Who wants to... Jeremiah, perhaps? Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm happy to have a first go at this. And I think actually the, the themes emerging amongst the questions yeah. Yeah. And, and the panel as well. And in our work, we think of sort of having, instead of the traditional human in the loop prescription, having humans around the loop at various places. And I think social partnership is a really good illustration where humans before the loop could be done. Now, the sort of gold standard would be some form of participatory design, where workers as data subjects are involved in the design. It's unlikely that, say, Microsoft Teams cannot possibly involve every single worker who will have to use it. One thing that's important to note, though, is that actually, when you buy in the software, often it's even not developed in-house, it still gets configured in-house. And I think that's a really promising oh, point awesome. at which you can have that contestation again, and where you can have worker involvement to say, even though you know, all these features exist, we're going to discuss which features we're actually going to deploy. And that's precisely where that kind of knowledge of the workplace comes in, where actually then also you know, trust is built, that win-win situation that um, Annette was also talking yeah. about. Oh, great, thank you. Um, Maria, you, you want to yeah, I was, address... On no, I was just reading the, the, one of the, the, the question, <laughs> the yeah. question uh, that you just read general, before. Yeah, please. No, I was just thinking about it, this question about if uh, AI management is able to give people to write to be imperfect. Uh, you know, that's, I can read all, but, uh, yeah. uh, you know, it maybe is giving the right to be imperfect, but I don't know if it's giving the right to be forget to be imperfect, uh, in the sense that you get your imperfection get registered in, in the data mm -hmm. that then enter the system. Mm -hmm. So then, what happened then? I don't know. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is just a reflection that came to my mind just reading this question. Absolutely, absolutely, good point. Right. Yeah, please. I just, just to build on that, I have this interesting story from California where, um, California uh, was the first state in the US to pass a consumer data privacy law. And um, you know they proposed it, then they asked for, for comments. And what was fascinating reading the comments, uh, primarily all coming from the private sector, was that the large firms like Google and company were all weighing in and asking California to harmonize with the GDPR. So this is a little bit counterintuitive the smaller firms were saying, don't regulate us at all. The, fir the larger firms clearly had an interest in wanting you know, one single standard. So that sort of goes counter to my intuition of how this might fall out when you have different regulatory regimes. But I offer it as an interesting example. Great, yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, maybe following up on the questions about you know, how do you, as a, as a large company, how do you uh, retrain workers um, to the benefit of, of, of those workers. I think one, one of the things that we see emerging um, is like these large companies asking researchers or having in-house researchers that experiment with um, the adoption of AI, because often the, even these large companies don't know not only which skills exactly their workforce has, but also what the um, impact of AI and algorithm, algorithm management is going to be at their firms. And some of these kind of studies um, are getting you somewhat surprising results. So, for example, there's a study by Eric Brinjolfsson and co authors um, where they, um, you know, with a the company, they um, kind of rolled out different divisions in different divisions of the company, they rolled out um, AI tools. And what they found was that, um, somewhat to their surprise, that it were the, the less skilled workers that benefited most from AI, whereas the higher skilled workers um, were actually, um, their productivity went, went, went down um, using uh, AI tools. And um, I think that's something that these big companies could do to not only uncover you know, which retraining we have to do in skills, but also first kind of assess what the impact of um, their specific um, adoption of AI um, has on their workforce and their skill demands. Great, thanks. Other questions for the floor, please.
Thank you very much and congratulations to the panel. My name is Aida Ponce del Castillo from the European Trade Union Institute. Um, I would like to know the panel views on the current legislative proposal of the platform work directive that it's been discussed and it has an equally tricky, dis tricky points as the AI Act. Um, there is a chapter on algorithmic management and my question is, how do you see the chapter being negotiated? Do you agree with the proposals from the Council? And uh, what, what, what would you say, say if whether the chapter of an algorithmic management is enough to regulate the current situation? And if not, what would be your ideal proposals? Okay. Thank you. No, th thank you. The question is a little bit uh, outside the scope of this panel, but I mean, I, I think we can, of course, um, you know, you can express an, an opinion about like the uh, algorithm management in that context, uh, if you want, but I wouldn't enter into the ne negotiation <laughs> process at the moment. It's quite delicate. Who wants, I mean, like, uh, somebody wants to, to take this? I mean, uh, uh, you know. I mean, I, I think as I hinted in my initial remarks already, I think the Platform Work Directive sets down a really good baseline standard. Um, the biggest change going forward would be, be through this recognition that it's yeah. not just about the platform economy, but yeah. it needs to be expanded. That's a political yeah. issue more than a legal technical one. Right, 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 exactly. Maybe, I mean, like, uh, it would be interesting to, to know maybe your opinion on this quickly on the fact that Indeed, you suggest that could be, this could be extended to the, let's say, more non-platform setting, the traditional. But the two settings are not really the same, obviously, you know, uh, for many reasons. So, you know, uh, what are the kind of differences that would beg for, you know, for, you know, for, for this not automatic uh, uh, translation of, uh, of the, the measures that are thought for, for the platform economy? to the traditional uh, places. Yeah, you see what I mean? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it is about sort of particularizing what's in the GDPR, because I think, again, what the Platform Work Directive does is uh, you have this issue with an omnibus instrument, and of course, even in the history of the GDPR, there was debate for quite a while, should we have employment-specific data protection, or shall we have this omnibus regime? Article 88 of the GDPR then creates that kind of compromise, and you yeah. see that in the legislative history. And so I think really particularizing what data protection means in the employment context, I think, will be very valuable right. for workplaces across the entire spectrum. Right. And the AI Act certainly doesn't fill that gap. Yeah, yeah. great. Thank you. OK. I have a question over there. And meanwhile, I will also read the, this one, uh, which is coming up on Slido. How relevant? is the differentiation between individual and collective gains from AI, can we redistribute the gains? Uh, that's another question for Slido. And please, yeah. Hi. Hi, thanks. Six Silverman, University of Oxford. Uh, I have two topics that I want to raise and add to the discussion. The first one is fissuring, which I guess is a very American industrial relations term. And the other one is about technical validity. And so my questions are, uh, in the platform economy, a lot of the discussion has been around employment status, both in Europe and in the US, and especially in California. But we know, for example, that companies like Uber and Amazon uh, make deals with very large and complex supply chains, right? So they make contracts with vendors who then have employees. So Amazon is holding the power, de deploying and operating the algorithmic decision-making systems, and the workers are employees, but not of Amazon. And so this creates a very complex accountability mm. situation that thus far seems to have escaped all of the regulatory frameworks that we've developed, and potentially even those that we're proposing today. The second question is about whether or not the systems work. In computer science, there's an interesting sort of emerging discourse around what's being called AI snake oil. Mm -hmm. And this is in particular developing around machine learning systems, less so around the more simple traditional automated decision making systems. But a good example comes from Uber, right? I can take an Uber ride, give my driver one star and say I'm upset because I wasn't allowed to smoke in the car. Well, Uber sets out very clearly in its rules that passengers are not allowed to smoke, but I can still get my driver fired for trying to enforce those rules and Uber will not intervene. That system is technically invalid, but we talk very little in these regulatory discussions about how to enforce technical validity of these systems. Thank you. Yeah, great. Th thanks a lot for the question. So we, we just have three minutes. Um, so I would say, please, uh, 
you know, say, reply to the questions and also take that as an occasion to, uh, for your closing remarks. Uh, uh, so please be brief. Annette, if you want to start. Yeah, yeah so very briefly, um, excellent questions. I would just uh, flag in the policy model that we developed in California that is now being adopted in other states, uh, at least in bill form, this question of liability of the, the, the uh, responsibilities for the employers in that model flow down to all labor subcontractors, absolutely, and there's joint liability. And I think any framework going forward has to have that, both to the labor subcontractors and then to the vendors. Um, so there's multiple relationships here. And then I'll just say on snake oil, uh, similarly, um, you know, there's some techniques that just should not be allowed. Facial recognition, you know, if cities are outlawing it for their criminal justice investigations, it shouldn't be allowed uh, in the workplace. Emotion recognition software, like there's a, there's a right. whole bunch of things that really are dubious that have not been tested that should just be um, on a blacklist in the employment context. Right, right, thank you, thank you. <laughs> An applause starting. <laughs> I mean, there, there is a consensus. So there. Okay, um, who wants to go next? So, uh, so, um, so I think quickly on, on the fishing, I think it's, it's one way of um, kind of managing from a distance. So headquarters managing from a distance what happens at, at workplaces that are outsourced. Um, that could be really amplified by the new algorithms and the AI tools that we have. We should be really careful about that. Um, but I think that's really a kind of like a niche of algorithmic management that is um, uh, already there. And I think it's only going to get, get um, more of a challenge to deal with. Um, there's also this question online on, on the Slido about the redistribution of gains. I think um, one take would be, look, in the long run, um, so far, technology has, has increased average um, income and average working conditions. Um, and to some extent, has also lifted the boats of the, 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 the worst jobs in our economies. Um, so that probably is also going to be the case with AI in the long run. But I think in the short run, we really have to think about um, making AI inclusive through, for example, that works councils that are um, f voting or you know voicing for the adoption of inclusive technologies, complementary technologies, uh, rather than automating technologies. Um, and it's not entirely clear whether we, you know, even in the short run, we can be as successful as we have been uh, with past technologies. So I think um, there's a big challenge there. But um, I think Europe is is very well placed to deal with these challenges of redistribution um, because we, we, we just have um, a good track record um, in making our labor markets as, as inclusive as uh, they can be. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, just three seconds. Just <laughs> <laughs> in the sense of uh, uh, thinking about workers' rights uh, as a collectivity and not just as an individual rights. And so having this kind of uh, new legal category in a kind of thinking about this legal category as workers' collective rights. Great, thank you. Yeah. I think just a very quick clarion call um, and a warning against any form of tech determinism. Um, there's no such thing as the future of work. How these technologies are deployed is very much up to our choice. And I think today and yesterday, it's really important that we have that sense of agency when it comes to ensuring that we get the benefits of the technology, but avoid some of the worst downsides. It's in our power. Thank you for this. Uh, you know, it's a very uh, nice way to conclude. So let me just, uh, uh, before I'm moving on, I mean, I just want to remind to everybody that um, this discussion is going on uh, uh, with the specific workshops we will have a workshop on surveillance and data protection in the workplace, then uh, um, a workshop on workers' involvement in shaping algorithms and co-design, and then finally, breaking bias, navigating workplace discrimination. So if you are interested, if you, I mean, if we elicited uh, interest in you, please uh, join us also uh, to the uh, institute uh, workshop. But for now, I mean, uh, um, let me also, you know, um, Thank the speakers because it was a very, very interesting discussion and join me in a big uh, thank you applause for them. Mario and speakers, thank you very much. And before we bid you farewell, just a few practical remarks. We're about to have coffee. Right after that, we have our first round of breakout sessions. 
Your personal program for the day is on your badge. There'll be three rounds of breakout sessions, as mentioned before, with plenty of room for interaction, for which we will use the Slido tool, and I encourage you to connect. Please return your headsets and visit the AI frame at the end of the Riverside area. It's an application that you can ask to create an image, and it will do so instantly. Now, enjoy your coffee, but not before we put, your hand, we put our hands together one more time for the panelists and Mario.